the Tuesday, January 23rd meeting of the Health and Education Committee. First order of business is to approve the minutes. Move to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Very good. Health Department. Hello, Ms. Garrett. Good evening. How are you? Good. We haven't seen you in a while. No. Well, fine. Um, so I'm bringing the December report uh, for your approval. And this kind of has our some of our year-end numbers for um, our clinic. We're up about 2,000 patient encounters for the year uh, between the two sites. Uh, we saw an increase, as we would expect, kind of as we went through the year. I talked about the Women, Infant, Children program increasing in Smyrna, which we'd expect as we increase staff in building down there. And then also the well child exams that we're offering while moms and dads are in the building with the children. We're just doing those while they're there because uh, we know it's hard for working parents to get back for well child exams. So we're trying to do those while they're there. And that kind of increased some of our numbers. So we saw that. Um, we've started, um, we do these Princess for a Day trainings and we have um, ties and tools for the boys. But in December, we did four of the Princess for a Days in Laverne High School, um, Case and Lane, Bradley Elementary, one other school. And that's just a program where we try to build a self esteem through some curriculum, evidence based curriculum that we have. And by building self esteem, we see that they make better health choices. And it is an evidence based program that when girls go through this, they're more likely to make better health choices in the long run. How are those schools um, chosen? Um, so a couple of different ways they're chosen. Number one, um, it, the coordinated school health directors point out to us which ones are have some after school programs with girls that are willing to participate and parents that are willing for them to participate and go through those programs. And then number two, we look at things like obesity rates, and um, high blood pressure rates. We have those for all the schools across the district, so we kind of choose based on those. Um, and then same thing for the boys as well, when we do those programs for the boys. Excellent. Are you still involved in ACES? Uh, yes, sir. So one of the things we've been working on with the ACES is the um, implementation of a screening tool that we're doing through just in clinic so for our patients so that we can start to have some community data. Um, one of the things we're charged with doing as a health department is community health assessment data and presenting kind of um, what does our community look like? What are the risks? What are we seeing? Um, and we had some very broad numbers but we didn't have really specific, so we're trying to get some of the big providers in our community, Primary Care and Hope Clinic, ourselves, and we're kind of working together on assessment ACE tools, and we're doing those assessments so that we can collect some baseline data and know where our uh, patients are at. So that's our number one, is get the data so that we can show <clears throat> not such generalization of data, but more specific data of the patients who are actually coming through our doors. The second things we've been doing is working with the ACES staff that they have through the school. Um, the city school actually has ACE staff, and we've got some after school programming that we're working with them on, and um, connecting them to resources back towards trying to end that cycle. There's things like tutoring, and connecting into special therapy sessions and all of that. So trying on, there's three different types of prevention projects that we're working on with that. And then the third is working with Juvenile Detention Center and um, trying to figure out that we know they've been exposed to some ACEs, so how do we prevent further ACEs? And uh, working with their director and figuring out how do we connect that and break that cycle where they've been exposed, now how do we prevent further? That's sort of where we're trying to 
hit it from different angles. Do you have funding for that? Uh, no, right now we do not. We've, we've written, we've been working with uh, MTSU uh, Health and Human Performance, and they've written a couple of grants. Both we were denied, uh, but we do keep writing for some grants on different things there. So the right city's now. is a grant, correct? The city's consistent yes, with that's correct. Ms. Christman, I believe, is the chairman or the there were, director of that. Yeah. They're a grant. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right, and I believe they hired two different people through that grant. Thank you. Yes. You see your, uh, I'm just looking here at the number yes, of child health. And yes. That continues to grow. Yes. It, it, um, it does. And I think part of that is us targeting those children that are in the health department for any service. And we're just like, while you're here, let's go ahead and make sure we're doing a well child exam. Let's offer you a dental varnish. So that's a sealant on their teeth to help prevent cavities while they're there we offer that and that can be done by a registered nurse that doesn't have to be done by a dentist so even in our Smyrna site we offer that um, where we don't have a dentist so uh, that's why we're seeing some of those child health numbers go up because we can offer those kinds of services right while people are in the clinic um, trying to make it you know easier for the, the parents and easier to be healthier do you have any kind of a flu report you want to share with us? Um, we have seen flu numbers, of course, uh, spike. This is the time of year when you see those numbers. Uh, we saw a little bit of a spike happen early this year um, in December. Uh, flu vaccine <clears throat> is absolutely free at the health department right now. So if you still have not gotten your vaccine, it is still able to be gotten and it's still recommended that you get it. Um, we are in the peak of it, but that doesn't mean it's not going to continue to happen well in through March and April. We'll see cases of flu. So, um, and there's absolutely no barrier now. There's, it's absolutely totally free. They've taken away the cost and everything. They usually do sometime around January and remove the, any cost uh, barrier. It's always on a sliding fee, but, um, and so it's um, at both of our sites, walk in, no appointment needed if you're interested in getting that at six months and older. Recommended for everybody. So. Any more questions, Ms. Garrett? I'll entertain a motion to approve the report. So moved. Second. All in favor? Uh, aye. Aye. Then you contract for us? Yes, I do. Um, so this is what you guys have already agreed to in July with the budget, but then the state sends their little contract that they want signed, and it takes them several months. And um, so that's what this is. It's just their contract of what you've already agreed to. No surprises. Yeah, no, nothing surprised. Showed it to Mark and Lisa. It's the normal Both thing. Second. Several closings to the contract? Uh, I don't think you do, but I'll be happy to. Yes, yes. Go ahead and feel both. Commissioner Cook? Yes. Commissioner Dodd? Yes. Commissioner Gurley? Yes. Commissioner Jordan? Yes. Commissioner Phillips? Aye. Commissioner Reed? Yes. Commissioner Allen? Yes. Anything else for us? Very good. Thank, Thank you, you guys. Okay. Appreciate it. See you soon. Thank you. All right. On the community care report, <clears throat> Mary, did you have anything you wanted to share on that? Ms. Cook is sitting there. <laughs> well, I asked her. She, she deferred to you, so I asked her before the meeting. So. <laughs> Their census is, is steady. Their budget is good, they're making money, their receivable was a good, overall they're doing great. I did notice on their report that they've got an opening now for the director of nursing. Yes ma'am. And then also the medical director, so the mm -hmm. administrator's accepting applications for yes. that I assume? I'm sure she is. Okay. We already have some, but it's, nurses are difficult, especially mm -hmm. directors of nursing to find. It's, it's a very important position. So if somebody was interested in that, should they contact Sonia or should they contact the administrator? They need to call the administrator to communicate. Okay. Okay. Let your nurse friends know. All right, I'll entertain a motion to approve that report. So moved. Second. All in favor? Uh -huh. Aye. Aye. Very good. All right, special projects. Are you Miss Jolly tonight? Yes, I am. <laughs> Okay, um, I think she put it out on the web this morning or sent it to you and you revised it. There was a, a payment that we received from the school board that I reflected okay, in the report. But pretty much, she got it meet last month, did you? Mm -hmm. you did not. 
so this now the report that I've given you reflects the activity from the last time you met to now, plus any uh, amendments that I had approved, which I think is just the one, and the money came in December. So that is now reflected in the reports. When you look at this, and I just get tired. I know. It's like, oh my gosh, really, we're done all these things. <coughs> done a lot. I'll give you all a second to look over the when we did get this in advance today. Anybody have questions about the report? Now, please pray we can take it home and get it sitting. Okay. Are there questions? I'll entertain a motion. Is there anything new on this report? Have we added anything to it since we met last time? No, I don't think there's any new projects okay. that we added, added money. She so had done a big update, I think, in November. In, in November and let's see, any. Because we had the funding. Yes, we're going to bond market in oh, November, you see. So that's. <coughs> All right, I'll entertain a motion. Move to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. School board. Okay. We got the whole family here today. We did. We <laughs> <laughs> a couple of high schools or something. I got they brought back. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, goodness. Um, I'm going to give you a sheet that we're going to look at. If, if, Madam Chair, if we could, I would like to look at the amendment, budget amendment first. Would that be okay? Absolutely. Okay, which is on yours. Um, this is a classified staff amendment to the general purpose uh, school budget. This amendment reallocates $184,832 in already budgeted pay and benefits for classified hourly staff based on the staff we actually have in place for the 2017-18 school year. The amendment also adds $195,549 in BEP revenue account 46610 and uses this revenue to fund pay and benefits for additional educational assistance for special students whose IEPs require the educational assistance. The total base pay in the amendment is $321,528 with benefits of $58,853 for a total of $380,381. This amendment increases the total budget classified hourly staff by 0.58%. You know, you make these budgets a year ahead, you were looking at it last May, and then when you get the numbers in and you have to serve the students under that, as enrollments or needs change, then it's, you, you'll see a number of amendments between now and certainly May as we kind of deal with some of this. So the motion to board pass was to amend the 184832 in already budgeted paying benefits for the classified staff to the different function object lines as presented and to appropriate an additional 195,549 BEP revenue account 46610 and use these BEP funds to fund pay and benefits for additional special education assistance as presented. Questions for Mr. Odom on that? Motion approved. Second. Commissioner Cook? Yes. Commissioner Dodd? Yes. Commissioner Gurley? Yes. Commissioner Jordan? Yes. Commissioner Phillips? Yes. Commissioner Reed? Yes. Commissioner Allen? Yes. Okay, true. And we, I gave you something tonight that you can kind of look at. Did you? And we got, I think everybody should have one. Um, the, the board worked on this um, back in November, and so we didn't meet, of course, in, in December, so it's January, and so what we're looking at, and you're not asking for money under this one tonight. But I want to kind of lay the, the groundwork for you, the basis of why the school system, what they will be asking for and what will be coming forward. Um, the first one is, the first page, kind of look, what, what does the state report card, which was released about weeks ago, uh, what does it say about Rutherford County, that sort of thing. So that top block that you see up there is basically Rutherford County, there are 44,067 students who they credited with last year. 
We are the fourth largest school district in Tennessee. Uh, we have now surpassed Hamilton County. Boy, if you add uh, Westbury City's almost 9,000 to it, you're, you're rushing towards Knox. <laughs> if you want to stop and think about that, but they're still somewhat ahead. Um, some other factors down there, we spent our per pupil expenditure, not our figures, but with the state, $8,643.20. Um, and if you look at that compared to two little blocks, I pasted in at the bottom, this is the state of Tennessee is on the right, on the left is Rutherford County. So little green arrows there that you can see. We actually spent last year in Rutherford County per pupil $1,314.60 less than the state average. Now I give this to you for this reason. Because your constituents ask you often, what about those schools? It is expensive. It's, it's your largest item in your budget. I know that. And so sometimes I, I want you to feel that you as a commission, our school board, and the staff in the central office are doing our dead level best to deliver a high quality school system at the cost, it's not always how much money you spend, it's how you spend the money. And we're an exemplary school system. State designation this year, not ours, but we were able to do this spending less. So if your constituents ask you, this gives you some basis that's actual from the state. Kind of look at the bottom. What is the local funding compared to the state? Um, about a half a percent different in Rutherford County last year of our budget, 40.32% came from local. Across the state of Tennessee, the average would have been 39.83. So you're down about a half a percent difference, but you put in about a half a percent more. Um, if you look down at the federal funding, we qualify for somewhat less federal funding than you'll find across the state. Much of that's poverty driven and the other factors that's in that. And so in this one, we can receive 6.64% of our budget would be federal. Across the state, that average is 11.82. So kind of you can see that difference. Um, and this is the next one, state funding. So one of the good things, though, we of our budget, 53.02% of our budget did come from state funding, not local funds. And that's better than the state's 48.35%. And Mayor, this is what we've been talking about for some time. We know that the Tasser and Fox Index for Rutherford County, at least we see preliminary information that they're gonna say Rutherford County in next year's budget, we don't know what it is, that we have more ability to pay. Um, so when they do that, what you'll see down there on state funding within school districts, where they say do not go to, to some of the counties, some of the very rural counties like that, you'll find that they may have 65-70% of their total budget is state. So it, it will not help Rutherford County if that TASSER is half, 50% TASSER, 50% FOX, about ability to pay. So we know very likely there's going to be some something happen there um, in relation to that, unless the legislature or something does something different. Um, now, now, what does it mean? What does that average mean to you? And this is just some dollars. If we spend $1,314.60, we know the property tax rate, basically our share, last I heard, after the cities comes out, is about $580,000. With our enrollment in that, we actually, by, by spending $1,300 less than the state average, we've actually said almost $58 million. Uh, less than what we would have done. Now the problem being, if we'd have had to make up that, it'd all been local money. And it would have cost you 99.833 cents on the property tax rate. So by being efficient, by you being efficient and holding us, and our board being very effective and efficient and working together here, I mean, as far as your taxpayers, look what we've done. With, with the monies that we have. So, um, and just kind of a little note there, the Rockvale 70 million, and we have almost 58 million in one year mm -hmm. uh, of trying to be effective and efficient. But don't say this negative at all, not my intention, but I think it may help you with your constituents to talk about what are y'all doing to hold those costs down? And we're doing pretty good. <laughs> you know, that kind of shows you what we're doing. staying a few more years on it. <laughs> That's super no, no, I don't know about that now, but, but we did pretty good and still come out exemplary uh, by prioritizing the right things. And, and you help us do that. I mean, I, 
have any qualms about that because we, we do need to tell you what we need and how we do it. If you kind of look at the next page, and this is numbers pool for today. Um, so the next page is kind of enrollment at each school, and it's not exactly alphabetical, or it's state, it's state or so the way the computer spits it out is the state school number order, which is close to alphabetical. But you can see the gains over the end of the fifth month last year. Our fifth month, because of the snow days and being out, it, all of the first eight months of the school year have to be 20-day months. So it pushes those dates and you change it till you get to the last month of the year. So it, it doesn't end till January 31st, but this compares to the fifth month last year. Um, today we're showing a 1,040 student gain over last year. You kind of looking at the bottom. You see the two numbers there. Um, where are our gains occurring? High school has been 400 more students with four grades, that's 100 per grade. Um, middle school gains is 372. There's three grades there, so they're actually gaining 124 students per grade across <coughs> the whole district. Your elementary, which really has six grades when you count kindergarten and the K and through fifth grade, um, 46.3. Um, so that, that's kind of new growth, and I've said this in here before, we are seeing our largest growth in middle and high. We've talked about that, you know, sometime in the past. So that's still holding true through the whole year. Um, the little arrow at the end, basically, um, what that denotes is, it, it, I just have the computer automatically mark it if it's 4% or more. Of course, Rocky Fork down there is brand new at 100% growth. Um, I will point out another thing or two. As you look at some of the schools there, you see a negative growth. That's a middle school. Remember, it's because of the rezoning. Uh, so if you look at a Smyrna Middle, you look at a Rock Springs Middle, and you see a negative number, well, they just moved from there to Rocky Fork. So it's just a relocation of those students. Our board did, I wisely, grandfather a lot of the eighth grade students that were on bands and athletics and that sort of thing at their schools. So what you'll see next year, after those eighth grade students finish this year at their old zone school, you'll see Rocky Fork go up very quickly. And it should create a little more capacity for us in the other middle schools, uh, simply because of that shift. We did open Rocky Fork this year. So uh, other numbers right at the very bottom, our whole PK through 12, pre-K through 12 40, is really 45,145. All students serve, and this means it goes into the state's computer system. But remember, we serve students under the federal law from age 3 to until they're age 22 if they have certain um, handicapping conditions. So when you take those students, but some of those do not stay all day. You know, basically when you look at everything I have in the top part of this sheet, that's your full seven-hour day students. But you do have some that may come in an hour or two a day or two or three times a week for speech or that sort of thing. So a head count, we're really dealing with 45,530 minutes. Let me take everybody. Any question kind of about that sheet or anything that you want to? You all haven't adjusted zoning at all in the last year, have you? I mean, um, I was looking here and Riverdale's only at 14 students. It opens up 100. Yes. And all the others are up substantially. Blackman's up 146. And I'm wondering, we how are we got that light on the Riverdale unless you push some students out somehow. Um, actually, it, it, there will be a huge zoning occurring this fall for the opening of Rockvale in 19. Well, I knew it was coming, but I didn't know if y'all had tweaked any lines. We actually have drafts <laughs> of, of how to look at. You know, it, I how many was times do you, know you got by with only 14 more at Riverdale? I mean, that just yeah. seems there are some subdivisions going out that direction. Right. And it's when those really apartments right. open down the road from yeah. there yeah. on yeah. Warrior Drive, I don't know what that number will yeah. be, but hopefully we'll have some estimates by then. Um, you know, how many times do you upset the apple cart and families and parents? And you try also, when you just look at your high school, you try to see what kind of alignment can we do to align our middle to where they go to high school. But you have to remember that it typically is two middle schools, sometimes three, Two middle schools serve one high school. So it's never one to one, and the same is true with elementary. Typically, each middle school will serve one, two, or three elementary schools. But our numbers go up. You know, as you get to your middle school, you're seeing very often 1,000, 1,100, and that sort of thing. Your high schools then get up to the, and our largest there is Blackman High, 
Of course, Blackman High, that area is still growing very, very quickly. When you look at Blackman Mill, thank goodness we added to that school now, with over 1,400. Uh, yeah, it's getting ready to mushroom around Stewart's Creek. Uh, uh, yeah. We've got several subdivisions that are, some are, have come to fruition and several more that are fixing within the next 12 months, six to 12 months to uh, begin to be occupied. So you're gonna see that area around there, just, it's gonna fill it up. And I'll continue to provide you with these sheets as I do with the Board of Education because you kind of need to know what's happening, what's trend. I think one of the better ways to look at trends, maybe the second sheet I have, um, I take my spreadsheet and make it populate the second sheet based on those numbers. So it's a little bit easier to look at when I cluster them. And, and I'm showing you this to say, how did the board kind of prioritize in the five-year plan and decide what goes in that five-year plan? So you're looking at that second, when we talk about elementary south and east, and I clustered Barfield, Blackman, Buchanan, Christian, and Rockvale. Um, and you see there a 2.3% increase or 99 more students. Now remember, K3 is 1 to 20 ratios, 4 and 5 is 1 to 25. So very often in your elementary, um, the requirement for another teaching space or something, still have 146 portables uh, in use, but um, about every 22, 23 students yet in elementary, you're going to create another teaching space or need one. Uh, how about our middle, south, and east? And this is, if you'll look, is our highest growing number again. But you remember from the other sheet, middle is going faster than anyone else. And so when you look south of Muffetsboro and wrap around towards the Buchanan area and that sort of thing, and we take kind of from Rockville and look at that arc on that particular side, you're seeing a 4% increase there. Um, with Rockville Middle up 6.1% and Blackman Middle up 5% there. So that whole arc in there that we're seeing some growth there. Uh, if you look at Blackman Elementary up there too, it grew 5.6 and here's Blackman Middle. Uh, you know, when you, you take a look at that too at 5, so we're looking at that about 5% in the whole Blackman area and in that, that quarter. A Smyrna Elementary area um, and it's really pockets of people there. And this is actually one of our issues with the board. You know, if everybody came in one or two here and it was spread out everywhere, but it doesn't work that way. Um, a new apartment complex goes up or a developer buys another farm and you get, you get these impacts that come very, very quickly. The largest increase we're seeing anywhere this year is smart primary. Would you have guessed? I would have never guessed. 10.3%, not a real larger school, so it made 65 students, but a huge growth. Um, and it has to be growing some from maybe the federally subsidized housing and all down there, mm -hmm. Rock Springs, some of that areas, you know what I'm talking right, about. Right, I do. Um, and you see it's Cedar Grove, which surprised us again there at 9.3%. Right. So th that, those two are really growing. Where Stewart's Creek, we did try to tighten up any zoning or things there a little bit. I only saw that Stewart's Creek only made 39 less and Stewart's Borough 5 less, uh, you know, that sort of thing. So you got 3.2% there. Our whole middle schools for the whole county, if you cluster them together, which is kind of in the middle of that sheet, a 3.4% increase. So that, again, goes back to what we were talking about middle schools. So your high school is at 2.8%. I'm not going to read it all to you. You can read it. The Laverne elementaries are not going very quickly right at this moment for whatever reason other than the fastest going still is Laverne Lake. We just don't have space to add to Laverne Lake. That's a problem. Watching when those apartments. I know. Oh, no, no. <laughs> We're fixing to snow yeah. you on those apartments. <laughs> well, we want to say to that where they're building those, that stretch of apartments. They're going to go, and actually we have contingency plans to add again to Roy Waldron if we have to do that. So that's that's just some issue for us there. And the, the middle school cluster in Laverne with Rock Springs Middle, uh, Laverne Middle is up a little, four students, but. The reason Rock Springs Middle again is down because that was impacted by Rocky Fall. We, the board moves some of those students. So, any kind of question about this sheet? It just it helps me look at it. It helps our board look at it. We're kind of clustering by grade groupings and parts of the county and areas to do that. So, again, I hope that helps that you understand. It. Just like what you have showed the cluster there. Of course, in my district right now, I was looking at you know I've got. I think every school I've got out there is in your upper cluster here. Uh, we were discussing this uh, yesterday at the planning meeting. Uh, 
I know out there on Walnut Road, we're, we're looking right now at close to 500 homes getting ready. They're, they're building right now and what we're approving. That's the Christiana Elementary area. And you've got Christiana Elementary right here at 6.4 over in the road. Now, yeah, and, those, and those homes are not yeah. even, uh, I mean, they're just coming up out of the ground. So we, we've got problems. We, I mean, and uh, Rockville Middle. I mean, I, I I stop in there every so often and I talk to the principal. And the Rockville Elementary, I see that one there too. And, and uh, I think every field out that way has somebody looking at some way of making a development there. And they're really high quality schools. You know, Rockville Elementary received the state award for being in the top ten percent of adding value to students grow and in the top 10 percent of the state for overall performance so people recognize quality they're, they're, we have to give them credit for it. these parents will look shop and they'll pick schools where it's happening they'll move <laughs> they go so it's important so we try to support that but uh, anyway i just thought about if you understand it kind of put the whole picture together um look kind of quickly at the the five-year building plan and, and i don't want to Boy, you're trying to go line, line, line tonight because you need time to sit down and look at it, just like our board did with that. Basically, your top lines there when you're talking about August 17 was when we were opening Rocky Fork Middle. We're still working on Smyrna Middle School renovations, which you're very much aware of. The David Urey renovation is complete. It's lovely. A really nice school. I, I'm very pleased with that. So you've got that part done, the $56 million there funded and in, in place. The second section, December of 18, um, we're working on the Oakland Middle Annex. Um, still some paperwork to be signed, approved by the city. Uh, we've got the funding in place, the bid in place. So how we, quick do you think we'll break that? We should that? have a uh, site permit next week. Okay, good. So we should good. start in there. Um, the Seagull High Edition is, is being done as we speak. You know, they've already started that. Um, our board is still very much concerned with the Laverne High and Smyrna High restrooms and concessions. So we left that in there and it shows up every time. But here's a shocking figure. I don't, I, mean, I don't know how many years ago now we brought this up to be done. Do you remember the price? And now we're looking at the figures we're looking at now, three million. Do you remember what our first estimates were? Three and a half. Was, it was less than that. Mm -hmm. Our first were about $250,000 each, or about half it's a It's that much. This has been floating around for I know. seven or eight years or something yeah. like that. No, yeah. We've kind of kicked it down the road, and, mm -hmm. and it's just, gosh, um, really jumping on us. So, but it is something that needs to be done. So we've also put in here about August of 18, we do need to look for land in South Murfreesboro somewhere for two or three schools. Certainly, probably for two, that would be that elementary middle. And Mr. Reed, that's in your zone. That's what I'm saying in that area. And what you're talking about those developments, we're looking at the same thing you are. That we need to see, and we're having trouble now finding pieces of land um, that's big enough to do the two or three school complex. We're going to do something though within the next week or so that we have not done in a long, long time. You want to tell them what your plan, what we're going to do. Uh, we are running some ads in the paper starting probably this weekend. Uh, I've gotten those written up and uh, they went to purchasing today and she's uh, contacting the papers to see when they can run. We're going to be running them on a Sunday, a Wednesday, another Sunday, and another Wednesday. Uh, we're looking, we have a set of boundaries written up for the area. Uh, we're looking for, uh, we're asking for requests for proposals from individuals, estates, uh, real estate agents, anywhere uh, that we can get them from. Uh, one is in the area out there at Christiana to the east of 231 in that area. Uh, the other one is up 231 north uh, of uh, Compton, I believe, and yeah, on that, yeah uh, around <coughs> Walter Hill. Uh, all of these are out of the city, so we have to have enough property for a step system to go in those. Uh, Walter Hill is currently 
we have a tight line laid back to the city sewer. It goes under the river. Uh, we've had to repair it a couple of times, so I would suspect that if we get property out there, we will take that wastewater and pump it into the step system out there and get off the city sewer and abandon that tight line. Back if, it's, to if it's within a reasonable distance. Right. Because it's, you, you might not get right across the street. Right. You could right. be right. two miles or something like that. Mm -hmm. You, you know, of course, what kind of catches there, if you take a look at Siegel Middle, um, and this is prior to Mr. Clary, so I can say this, the design of Siegel Middle was kind of not the T formation between the buildings, but the wing, you know, the sloping wing. So when we look at adding to Siegel Middle and that part of it, like we're doing at Oakland, like we've done already at Blackman, it just does not lend itself from that original design to go in and add to it. <coughs> Very difficult to do on the land that we have. You know, and, and with our 146 portables, I'll make this statement also. We've tried to do what you said. We've added and added a lot of places. We, we're adding buildings, but in some instances when we build the, when we wind up moving in the new wing we built, by the time we get the kids that are sitting in portables in it, we only have two or three years of growth left. So there are times that we've got to start looking at now and think, you're better off. Is it better off on 231 North? To tr since we can't do Siegel too well, we're going to have some capacity at Oakland, but they're building on 96 stores, last chassis now. That subdivision is starting. Are we better off to go out there and build a school, even if it opens with 500 or so, than you are to go in and put, spend a lot of money on a wing that time you move your portables out, they're not going to hold you for two or three years. And that's something you're going to have to consider going forward. There there comes a time when you're better off to kind of start with that new building and have some capacity that may eight or ten years. So that, that's what we're going to see. And then uh, we're looking for a piece out around the 840 corridor, uh, 96 Highway, Animal Road, maybe back a little closer to town in that area and all of this will go in the paper and uh, we hope to get a uh, good sampling or a good result of what's out there and uh, get some good prices. We've looked at two pieces out in your area already that are $17,500 an acre. Uh, we've got some floodplain issues with those that we can overcome uh, but we will, you know, we're open to looking at other areas. Um, once you get out there on some of those crooked roads, it's pretty difficult to to get students in and out. So we've got to have it in the right location if we can. Are you putting this information like on the county website or on Channel 19? Because a lot of people don't take the newspaper like they did years ago. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, we can do that. That's yeah, it's good. Land to do that. You yeah. put it on. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, somebody can that's click on it there. and. Uh, yeah. And go yeah, schools got a Facebook page. I know that's how we find out schools are closed now. They follow it on Facebook, <laughs> yeah, you know. So yeah. Yeah. I don't know how many people actually read the newspaper like they used to. Yeah, James Evans calls. They're all going to listen. <laughs> yeah. the song you heard recently. Yeah. Right? Yeah. He's the most popular guy at RCS. Yeah. And even those are limited observation, I think, Will. Mm -hmm. Even your Channel 19. So I yeah. suppose there's a well, if you just try way, as many, all discussed a better way. Try as many points as possible. Channel on 19. the website on Channel 19 and in the paper, you know. Have yeah. James Evans call. Don't have any of that property. You know. yeah, that that be be the Here's his cell number. You know. He has I guess a large you could send it out on the notice system. Well, we can do uh, We can do text messaging and what you all looking at some land on shores and and out veterans. At one time, we we do, and, and you know, and, and in the background here is the parks development. Seven hundred fifty. How many homes in the park development? Seven hundred fifty homes in that area, which when it really kicks in, so you're going to be trying to feed, basically for your high, middle school area, the fourteen hundred you already have in back in the middle. So it's not going to hold long. The only thing it's close to is Stewart's Creek Middle, and Blackman Middle. So we know that's not going to last very long. Have you reached out to a lot of the big? Um, commercial realtors. We do. So they all know. So they, they, I mean, they give them the same information. And some of the proposals we're getting now are really for, 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 for. Our board, as we talked about it, and they were unanimous in it, 
let's really be transparent as we can mm -hmm. possibly be. Mm -hmm. And it may still come back from a commercial realtor, but at least from your standpoint, from your constituents and ours, we want to be totally transparent. If you've got something you want to offer, yeah. let's look at it. One of the uh, main issues is cost. Right. I mean, you know, we're getting priced up in $80,000 an acre, $120,000. Yeah, some of the veterans do. So we're trying to find something to hold cost down. Right. I just know we have to cast a wide net to, I just say, throw the net as wide as you can, and, you know, right. throw back the ones yeah. we don't want. And, and I would encourage the board to, if you buy a piece of property at a good price, hold on to it, because the board turned and s around and sold a big hunk of the property that was bought from my mother's estate yeah, it's smart at a time when, you know, for it, it was bought for nothing like you're talking about, even the bottom dollars now, and, and it was disposed of, and, you know, it's right there, sewer available, and access available, and all the services available, and so I think that's something the board needs to think of, if they are, do find a piece of property with a little more property than, than what's needed, then, you know, hold on to that for a while, because growth continues at the rate it's going, at some point in time, they're going to need it. If the word gets out that you're looking, they'll find you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But now, if the word gets out who's buying, that's it the price it. you're going to get. I, know. <laughs> I mean, that's just the, we way, that. that's the way that works. Yeah. I think you're going to have to kind of, you know, I know everybody wants to uh, do what they can, but at the same time, you're going to have to kind of appeal to, you've got a lot of good people in this county who, if you appeal to their heart, it's on uh, the, uh, you may find some right. people willing to sell at the right price. If you're buying a piece of property and it say it's on veterans and it costs you sixty, seventy thousand dollars a acre compared to one that's four miles away, it's on some back road. Probably better off to pay the higher mm -hmm. price. Sewer and everything. And get your yeah. school where it needs to be because your land cost is a small service. percentage yeah. of it all, yeah. and you're going to put your school in the wrong place for the next hundred years yeah. because it was going to cost another million dollars right. per piece of property. I'm not saying go out and throw the county tax dollar, yeah. taxpayer dollars away, but buy the right piece of property, and if it's a little higher than, you know, saving. Five thousand dollars an acre to put it in the wrong place where those buses got to go, where those kids got to be transported forever more. But there are people out there. I, I know people. I mean, I've been here. I'm fifth generation, grew up on a farm, and there are people out there that don't want their farms to be subdivisions. Mm -hmm. And there are people out there that would probably like to have a school out there. They might ask to be named after their dad or something mm -hmm. like that. We've got some of those schools, mm -hmm. you know, out there. And, so, and if you can find those right families that would rather have something like a school instead of a 400 townhomes in a row. More of a legacy. Uh, More of a yeah, legacy. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that you just got to find those people, and there and there are some of them still out there. You know, Carlton said a few years ago, I told him, former superintendent, he said you better put the school in the right place because you're going to transport them 50 years to it. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think mean, it was relevant. Mm -hmm. A number of years ago. So Oakland and Riverdale are nearly 50 years old now, and <laughs> we're not about to close that down. 1972. Yeah. How much You're land right? do you take up with the steps? Well, a lot of the significant portion. Uh, for a percentage wise. Well, just say for three school complexes, it would take about 25 acres. Yeah. So, Same sewer year. is a definite advantage in terms of when you, when you get into higher land costs, yes. you can afford to pay a little bit more versus buying more property. Right, if, uh, if the sewer is handy, right. but uh, it's been my experience now that it is cheaper to put a step system in than it is to run the sewer through four miles or five miles. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if I'm, I'm saying the sewer is yeah. available. Yeah. Right. So just kind of going back to that again, I think we talked a little bit, the Rockville High, the Starge Elementary School, to address some of that Mr. Reed's talking about. Um, you know, we, it's get the Rocky Fork Elementary, we pushed that back, you know, slash and went to Oakland and did some things like that. But what's got me wondering, didn't we make a wise decision to smarter primaries grow and see the grows now? Now, um, my concern is we have a design for that, we have a land for that, we have commitments from Smyrna for roads and stuff. 
that we probably don't need to kick this one down the road because the costs are going up so quickly. You know, are we better off to then look pretty quickly at going ahead and, and let's go ahead and do the Rocky Fork. Remember, we're now doing two-story. It takes a little bit less land for us to do, but we're doing middle, high, everything is two-story. Rockville High is really going up quickly and they're working yeah, it's there, on man. up in that. Um, so that just kind of matches with what we talked about on the other page. And then you can, I'll not read all that to you, you can look at kind of 20, 21, that sort of thing. We put August 23, the high school, <laughs> you know, I know that you want them at least five years apart. So I don't know if, if high schools and middle continue to be the fastest growing, I'm not sure exactly what will happen there. But this is just something for you to sit down and look at um, and see. On the Oakland Middle Annex, since we were delayed by the city, is that going to change that opening date? We had it set at December, December 18th. It's, it's marked at December 18th, is that what correct? Yeah, that's good right now. <coughs> we don't have a building permit yet, but we're getting a grading permit. And same with the Siegel edition, it's still set for December 18th? Yes. And they'll probably make, for sure. The, the nice thing about that, we'll not have to rezone to get into it. And, you know, and if, 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 if it's February, that Oakland Middle, for some reason that you get into it, you move the kids out of the portables and unpack some of those other areas you've consumed in the building and put them out there. But then they're going to get caught by the total rezoning that's going to occur starting this next fall uh, that's associated with Rockville High and the domino effect that's going to occur across high schools all across. You think you're going to have to do like, like one of my children got caught up in with the smart little Laverne bill where you just, there was no no exceptions uh, for anything, you know? You know, if we can get, I, 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 I would love for parents to be able to absolutely pick exactly where they go. Uh, my job becomes much easier, <laughs> uh, you know, when that happens. But the other thing that we run into is just the overall capacity in the situation, unfortunately. That's right the way it was with Smart on the Farm. Right? We haven't been able to catch up enough to totally open it. Um, your high schools kind of, and we start, around the 1st of February zoning applications for the next year. We know we pretty much can't take additional app, uh, uh, zoning things for open high school next year. You know you really can't take it from Blackman High. Look at their number, 2300 up there, growing at that right. You know that's kind of got to be closed. We pretty well know Stewart's Creek's got to be closed. But we can open up Riverdale some because of some of those numbers we talked about. Seagull High can open up and take some more students. So anywhere we can, we try to do it. They get tangled in so much of theirs though because of TWSAA and wherever you start as a freshman, <coughs> declare your residency. So parents have a really hard time. They almost have to make that move as a freshman year unless they physically relocate their home. They get caught. Any other questions? Again, I just leave it for you to study and look at because We'll probably be back to you maybe next month looking at some item in this thing to take these steps to begin to address it. We kind of look at these dates and where we need to go. We'll have that discussion with the board, uh, what to do, but we're going to have to have more brick and mortar. And it's, it's pretty much a school a year or two. And we've said that before, but it's here. What are any of the things that you're looking at and other systems across the country that are, they've already had these problems, they've already had these big growth spurts, and is there a next generation of how you handle this kind of growth with education? Is there a model you haven't explored? You know, we looked at the multi-track and that sort of stuff, but they still do some of that in California or some, um, some one place right out of St. Louis. The other one, um, they, did it, they did that in Orlando. And, and at that time, I was still a principal, but I went to the year-round school convention, that sort of thing, and talked to the, um, talked to, to the, we went into Shoney's or something there, and I said, I said, I'm going to ask the waiters, and they're the one that had to live it with their kids. They did a little question, and, and it wasn't popular. They had, unless they started it again, they dropped it after a little while. But here's what you run into. Suppose you've got a kid in elementary and one in high school. What if they don't have the same breaks? I mean, when do you get vacation in? So one of the hardest things those districts tell you is um, then band needs to be on the same track as football if they're going to play at the football games. Mm -hmm. 
and your kids are separate. So I can tell you in places where they do it, um, it doesn't improve instruction. They're, the year-round people will say it doesn't hurt it, but that's as far as they'll go. But I can tell you some families and people say, I just don't want to do that unless I have to, simply because it separates my family so much to try to accomplish that. What about increasing any of the distance learning options, especially for high school students? We, you know, we write, we now have the online, right. so we get some graduates. We do night school, we do online, um, we do Holloway, we got some, we have a, I, it'll surprise you how many kids now finish in three years. I should know if that was an area um, we wanted, we were looking at possibly we, growing. We're there, yeah. we're there some, okay. with that already. Um, there's several things in it. Uh, where a kid has to have now under the state board's rules, they have to have an elective focus or something. So is, is that a career technical education focus or is that an arts focus or what? That kind of limits some of that. They've made it a little bit more difficult for families to do. They can do part of it, but it's difficult for them to pull it off. I guess those are some things I was curious about. You know, do do we need to work with our state legislators? You know, have they are there unintended consequences to rules that are in place that tie our hands where we can't be more creative? And, and that's I guess that's what I'm not listening really like to. like us in Rutherford County yeah. and Williamson County, yeah. and not as much in Wilson. You know. um, I, we are definitely seeing in Rutherford County more opportunity students. Um, and look at the demographics back on the first page that I kind of gave you and that sort of thing. So. Um, our cost to help kids catch up to do things like that are certainly going up. Um, so the challenge is going forward with that you know, around the donut, around Nashville. Um, and you, you've been hearing the same thing we have not used. There's no more affordable housing in Nashville. So when the, the Catholic charity brings in some immigrants or things like that, they're looking for housing vouchers in places. Try getting a housing voucher in the Williamson County. Try getting a housing voucher in much of Wilson County, especially in Mount Julia area. So guess where they're looking for housing vouchers? Wilson County and Cheeto, things like that. So, um, you know, our location, as real estate says, location, 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 and available housing or space is driving that. And so one of the reasons we're still experiencing a lot of growth is simply because what's happening in this whole Middle Tennessee area has continued to grow. Do you know West Tennessee is losing students? So when you talk to the legislators and that sort of thing, they are closing schools. They're having that out there. Parts of East Tennessee, I don't know whether you followed that, or they're trying to they're consolidating some high schools and putting it together. Um, we are we're not unique in that we're the only one, but we certainly are not the typical of what's happening across all of Tennessee. Middle Tennessee is very different. Back to the the year-round thing, and I, I, I kind of agree that year-round is not good for everyone, but I've done some looking at some systems that have done hybrids. You know, our, for example, middle school, if you told me when Stewart's Creek Middle opened behind my house that we'd have a, another middle school as equal size 2.2 miles down the road. I said, no way, but we do. So geographically, we've got two middle schools there, really not, 2.2 miles is nothing. And we looked at the possibility, and, and I think some of these districts that I've looked at have done this on a somewhat, and I don't know that that's gonna be totally applicable to us, but, uh, as a temporary thing uh, to buy some time, but but some people are happy with a with a year round, and some people aren't. But when we have elementary schools within almost sight of each other, or middle schools within almost sight of each other, one of the things I think we might look at is possibility of a hybrid, where we have you know one school is year round and the other one is is not year round or on a yeah. multi-track and not, and so on, so that's just... year round gets mixed up, so a few years ago there was an experiment done, if you remember, Siegel Middle School and Cedar Grove Cedar Elementary Grove. School, did, they called it year-round, but basically it was not a multi-track year-round. Right. So they, um, and of course when you do that, you got to run your buses, you got to run your cafeterias, you got to do some things like that, but they gave parents the option, and really the board discontinued because parents, they really didn't want to do that. 
Actually, I was one of those what parents you in Cedar Grove, and we loved it. You loved it. We okay. loved it because but, we got, of course, at the time, you have to remember, you know, the school didn't get, a traditional calendar didn't right. get a fall break. Yeah. And so we got the fall break. We got the nice, we got, a, you know, a, a decent Christmas break. It was summer break, you know, and it was spaced out enough that by the time, and even the teachers told me, they said, you know, by the time we get a, you know, we're all exhausted and tired of each other, we get a break. <laughs> and then everybody comes back fresh. And also that learning. But you don't get any additional yeah. students in that moment. Yeah. You, yeah, you have don't get to go yeah. the you're right. track and move. Right. Model. I mean, I talked to principals that did that. They said, Bobby, I have trouble getting the kids pictures. Yeah. And you don't have all of your right. <laughs> kids at school at any one time for the yearbook. Uh, because one track's out, or training teachers and that sort of thing. One group of teachers is out. Staffing, it would be my big concern. I think that would be our biggest challenge, is trying to staff another that, model. When we were talking about it years ago, coming from the, the hotel and hospitality side, I saw our maintenance expenditures skyrocketed as we reached full occupancy. Uh, we were paying premium dollar to have things done off times <laughs> such as they were available. Uh, but just the sheer wear and tear on our facilities, we just our maintenance mm -hmm. budget just ratcheted up. When you got into staff support positions, you would be increasing the dollars you were paying for that aspect of running the school more than the additional propor the proportion of students you gained. There, there were some, it, it's not, it's, it lowers your building costs, but it will raise your operating costs in a lot of different areas above and beyond And you never, can do, you can never can maximize the one-third in no. the four-track system. Mm -hmm. One Every of the complaints I heard, and this is when Dr. Ragsdale was here, uh, like he was talking about California and Florida, that it split the families. Yes. yes. And the families could, mm -hmm. and the teachers could they couldn't have the time to do their summer education that they wanted to do. And it kept them from growing in their education. And it split the families real bad. I don't want to take up any more no, no. of your time. I know y'all got other things. I think Mayor had something to, something to say. I, I want to say, compliment them on a number of things. And I'll start with Mr. Clark, you know, in the building program. I think we're building our structures at a cost probably as good or better than anybody. So I'm very pleased with your standardization of design and all of that, okay? I do support finding some land, and even if we have to hold it a while, I think that would be a wise move. So I think you're on the right track there. But I want to give a little bit more concern here about where we're going long term and what it's, the impact is going to have for the county. On this piece of paper, and I, I don't think if you've ever said you can plan five or six years out in advance. No, we're not good. So I think one or two years is about as far as we can get right now. But if I look at what we've got going on right now with Rockville and a couple of other schools you're making some additions to, that's about 25 hundred additional students or seats. In every year thereafter, you've got two schools, two schools, two schools, one and one. And every one of those schools are, all, are approaching $40 million in total cost. We're amortizing every year now in our current budget about $30 million. Now all of these are going to be doubling that amount of money that we're going to have to support debt-wise. And so we're going to have to double whatever our debt service is for uh, the county in total. Most all of the debt is schools debt anyway. So, and then I haven't even computed, Lisa may have, I haven't even computed what the additional operating costs are every year. We know full well that increases the operation, operation expense every time we open a school. And some of them as much as a few million dollars a year. All I'm telling you folks is you probably need to know this, but I just want to reinforce it. There's no way we can sustain this without a property tax almost on the average every single year. And I'm not talking about a few pennies. So it's just buckle up. I don't know where we're going to go with this. But the other thing I want to say, I know this five-year projection, when I look at these other five years, eight new schools, three elementary, four middle, and a high school, that's 9,000 seats, and three additions, that's probably another 1,500 seats or so. All of this together with what we got building is like 13,500 seats. That's 
approaching a 5% growth average rate. I mean, it, that's how much growth it would take in student enrollment to fill those seats. So maybe we're just a little, I, right now we're a little under, what you said, 2.3% or something, I think. We're a little under, at a 3% rate, 7,000 seats would be enough to accomplish what you're trying to accomplish. So I'm just saying we've got to think a little bit more conservatively, maybe, about how many seats are enough. And I know it's a tough, tough job for you to know where to put them, but I just, uh, and hopefully, through the process this over the next three to five years, we'll find that we don't have to build one school because Murfreesboro is talking about building one, maybe. They keep talking about finding some property out on the south or southwest part of our, so. I think caution and, and a little bit of patience and, and some more serious planning is going to be very, very necessary for us to sustain this. Right now, the track we're on, and you ask, where else can we find something like this happening? And basically what Mr. Uh, Odom has told us, nowhere really except here in Middle Tennessee is right. much of like this happening. So we don't have a model, but I just don't know how we're going to fund it. A little bit of Carolinas and Charlotte and Mecklenburg. And you know, use some so of that for a little bit without of major, and as he's telling you, they, as they move toward this, uh, away from the original model on this BEP formula, things even get more difficult for us. There's no question about it. And like he just said, many of these counties are not even building a school. They have no debt. They have no capital requirement. So they do get the benefit of the capital piece that comes through BEP, and they're using that in their operations. And None of our, and his $8,000, $9,000, whatever our cost is per student, that doesn't include a penny of the debt that we're having to support and pay the principal and interest on. Not one, which is about almost $30 million again. I don't want to rain any doom on all this, but I just want us to all have a realistic view of this is not going to be just a one-time fix. This is a forever problem, and it's going to take major solutions or else we're going to put a major burden that I don't think our taxpayers are going to be able to manage. Well, and that dovetails to my question, which was, you know, is there any way to be more innovative than the brick and mortar? And I know, I, I know it's needed, but this is what we've always done and the way we've always done it. Is there anything else we haven't considered, is all I was thinking? That's what we need to have a lot of thought on. Maybe we need to have a contest. <laughs> I, Usually you speak up. I'm, I'm overwhelmed. That, <laughs> and I just continue to be. It's just mind-boggling to me to think of where I went to school <laughs> in Laverne and, and, and where we are now. It's mm -hmm. this, I, and I still am, am really concerned about getting not only kids, but citizens from point A to point B, yeah. being a, a county planner for 24 years and, and what we're going to be faced, it, it's, it just, it's just mind-boggling to me and I see where you're looking at m maybe buying, uh, looking for two pieces of land and, and I'll go back to what we said this past fall that I'm not <coughs> going to approve anything unless there's some traffic study as to the impact of building those schools uh, with a particular piece of property. So if you, if you come back with some property that you want, I want to not only know where it is, but how the impact of those schools are going to affect that area and, and what is needed in addition to just brick and mortars and schools. We can no longer build house after house and school after school on the road structure that we have. So just just planning for 30, 40 years down the road, if we're not doing that as part of this process, we're not doing our job. So I, I, I'm not only concerned about brick and mortar in the schools, but just the transpor transportation perspective. And I know Murfreesboro has gotten real aggressive as to what their transportation needs are, and there's a possibility we can piggyback on some of those things, some of those things, and save some dollars. But, but just in addition to just in addition to the dollars is is just the infrastructure that it's going to take to get there, and 
it's a, I don't know, I, I guess I'm at that particular uh, age to where it, it's hard to imagine 700, 750,000 people here. Yeah. Um, it, but it's coming and, you know, you, you, you mentioned 2%, 2.5%, .2 and, and that's, that's about right, 2.5%, 3% a year, uh, and we can absorb that for a year, but year after year after year, all of a sudden you talk about 20 years down the road and you're talking about almost 50% additional population coming into this county, and, and how do you sustain that? Just like the mayor is saying, how do we do that? You know, and, and that's what some of us are saying here. Okay, it's a problem. Maintenance is a problem. But let me give you a, a clue. It's what, how industry runs, how businesses run. They build facilities. They run them three shifts a day, 24 hours a day, most of them now seven days a week. And their philosophy is wear them out. Utilize those facilities that we built. Wear them out. When something breaks, we fix it. When something needs repair, we fix it but utilize the return on that investment. And that's what some of us are saying without coming out and saying it, is that somehow, some way, just from a, a financial perspective, some of the problems, the year-round year school and the multi-tracks and all that may cause, is it, is it worse than going out and building new schools when, Jeff, I'd rather pay for having those schools repaired than to build a new one. If we can utilize that school, we've already paid for it, so let's just put more money in it. And I think we've done a pretty good job over the last 20 years or so in maintaining our schools. But, you know, that, that's what commissioners like me are saying. Don't always look at the way we, we have been looking at it. We, we have to think outside the box. We have to think differently as time is, 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 is things are moving forward. You mentioned East Tennessee. You know, there's some projections that Rutherford County will be larger than Knox County in the next 35 or 40 years. Just imagine that. And, and, and where are we going to go with all this? It's, it's I saw a report yesterday where we're, we're not where we were pre-depression or pre-recession, but we're approaching it. Mm -hmm. You know, with over a thousand new properties coming on board this past year. I don't know where that'll be this year, but a thousand new homes, just multiply that over 10 years. What? And, and all of those families that come in, it's, it's, it's mind-boggling. I know you're trying to deal with that, but, but we as a commission are trying to deal with that too. And, you know, the, what, if, what if we said, as a commission, we said, we're not going to deal with this anymore. <laughs> we're going to turn all the finances over to you. Would you all look at it differently? Would you? You know, would you look at it differently? When you had to face the whole citizens of Rutherford <laughs> County, and say, we're going, to, we're going to raise property taxes by 40%. Would you do it? Would you do it then? And, and that's what, what we're trying to, trying to figure out. You know, we want to support you, and I think we have been supporting oh, yeah. 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 And, and We've worked together to do this. That's why we're doing it cheaper than other places. And, and nobody's, <coughs> nobody's saying that what you presented here is not needed. There's nobody saying that. But is there some alternative? You know, come to us with an alternative to that. Can we add to this middle school? Can we add to this high school? Can we can we do those types of things without complete new brick and mortar and complete new high schools? And I'm also concerned that we continue to build close to each other. And I'm concerned about those things, you know, 20, 30 years from now. Where are the kids going to be 20, 30 years from now? Are we going to have to bus kids from the Manchester end of the county all the way to Blackman area just to fill those high schools up? I don't know. You guys have an awesome responsibility, and I commend you for 
the job that you've done, and I know you've got uh, a job to do, and you're doing it pretty well. But you know, there's there's just so much going on in the county that, that we're having to do. And the fallacy of it is that we don't these schools that we're building we don't own them. Bondholders own them. I mean, they're being financed. We're not paying cash for these schools. At least I didn't. You know, we're issuing a bond, right? So we don't own them. It's just like taking a mortgage out on your house. So all those facilities that we're building are really not an asset to the county. They're, they really don't belong to us, the county, the citizens. They belong to somebody who holds a bond on them. So, I mean, just like your car when you drive it off the lot, you know, starts going downhill. And so I think we've got to, and there's got to be some smart people in Rutherford County. I know there's a lot of people in Rutherford County who've got to be smart. I mean, I'm, I'm open to hearing suggestions. I think we've got to look at all aspects, uh, you know, because we're in a new crunch. We're in a new place that Rutherford County hasn't ever been before. And that's we're growing so fast that we can't keep up with it. And so we need to, all the citizens who happen to be listening out there in Channel 19 land, we need your input. We need input from smart people who have ideas. I want, I, commend the board, I commend the administration for doing such a great job that they've done. But you guys are up against what, the same place that we are, where we are in it together. We're in a territory that we haven't ever been in before. And so we're gonna, it's gonna require some innovative thinking because, you know, when you start pushing those tax increases, then, <coughs> At some point, it uh, gets to be a hard sell. I wonder if we ever get to the second <coughs> ship. But I was a little boy, most of the world dried up at 8 o'clock at night. There was nothing open past 10 o'clock except the hobble. Mm -hmm. Nothing. <laughs> you drive down Memorial Boulevard at 2 o'clock in the morning, there's traffic. People live differently than they did 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. You know, so many of these plants are working third shift, so many of these businesses are open 24 hours a day. I mean. I don't think we're there yet, but did we get to a point where we have a night shift? They I, come in at four and stay till I think it may happen right nine now. Nine to ten or something, you could double your capacity overnight. That's the, the state. The state right now, the minimum day is six and a half hours. Yeah. To, to stockpile days for snow, you have to do seven. So, yeah. um, I mean, they set that time frame on the so If you had two seven hours, you'd be off ten. But <coughs> you're gonna be pretty early in the morning, and you're gonna be. It's going to be night. Uh, my parents might work till 6 in the morning. I, mean, I don't know. Do you ever get the point they go to third school at midnight? I don't think I would want my children to school at midnight, but I'm just wondering. Does it come to a point? I've heard that some other countries do night shifts. Japan, I've heard that. But there was, but I don't know if it's so or not. I don't know. Scary thought. Buses out there running. One o'clock in the morning, something like that. Any other committee members have something they want to share? One thing, you know, I'm just sitting here and it keeps hitting me in the face right here. We're looking at 45,000 students. Uh, that's two times larger than what we have out here at MTSU on a daily basis. Uh, you're looking at 22 to 23,000 out there each day. And not full-time equivalent either. And not full-time equivalent. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that's a lot, that's a large number. And that's why we have what we have. You know, I don't know how many of you, I had gotten where I had turned off the Today Show in the mornings because it depressed me every time I turned that thing on. I just didn't like to listen to it. Uh, I mean, what they would say and whatever. But one morning, just recently, I turned it on and I was getting ready and they come across with this new Amazon that's, that's coming out, I'm looking for a place for Amazon. And they were showing where it was going to might possibility be, and they, they put it in Nashville, Tennessee, a new Amazon. 
50,000 employees. And I looked at that, I said, no, please don't let it be that. <laughs> because 50,000 families are not going to live in Nashville, Tennessee. They're going to come in looking for, oh, let's see what's around there. And they're going to look at, oh, that's a nice place down there. Uh, they have a university. They have all of this right here. And I just saw, well, I know what, what draws them to Rutherford County. Just Saturday morning, I was sitting in a uh, MTSU uh, alumni board meeting. And one of the things that was brought out with President Fee out there was the fact that when that the area around Nashville, the main age there coming in there of families is 28 to 30, age 28 to 30. And all of them have college degrees, the majority of them. And what MTSU was looking at is the fact that we're trying to build a, uh, uh, we're trying to bring them into our master program and we're trying to develop PhDs out here now and what they want to do there. But these are the types of people that are coming here now. When I heard 28 to 30, I said, they got elementary children. That's what's coming here. And that's what we're dealing with. So on top of everything else of what we've said here, which I totally agree and understand, it's, it's the cost and whatever, no matter what the president says, there's no wall between this county and anything else. They're going to come here. We've got this problem, and the growth is there. And just as Commissioner Phillips says, this, this problem of traffic, it, it is there, and we've got it. When it takes you 30 minutes to get from MTSU to Sam's, and I'm not joking, I mean, some days it can do that within this city. And uh, I mean, when you're on the one side of the county to the other side of the county, uh, that's a major drive. And what we've got to do, all of this figures into this. So uh, just as we've said here, think outside the box. Yes, uh, I think you know that has to be looked at. But you know, 45,000 is a large number. It takes a pretty good size box. I mean, it really does. Uh, Jeff, this I have to look at that. This 435 million bucks mm -hmm. that we're talking about there is. is it's no operating cost at all. No operating cost. Just at all. some type of an estimate as to what the operating cost would be in addition to that. Uh, two and a half to three million for a middle school, five for a high school, million and a half to two million for an elementary. But some of that cost. Yes, it's an additional cost in your first year, like Rocky Fork, that cost broke. As we get more students in, a lot of that cost will average out. Take a number of kids, it'll hold and, and multiply times 8,643 would be your current number. Yeah. yeah. That's how much you're going to spend but for a child. some of it cuts. Some of that money will move from other schools. Mm -hmm. More at an elementary, something less at a middle school. and. At high school, because of all of your course offerings, you'll transfer in less from other schools. So it, it really is a blend. From a safety perspective, that's what I'm concerned about as it relates to getting kids from sure. from their homes to sure. the new schools that we're building and are the roads adequate? Is the infrastructure? We have to have more buses I because know. you know people don't yeah. understand. So you got a hundred passenger bus. Yeah. You can't stop at every house a minute and load a kid. That's a hundred minutes. Think about it. When you're and then you got to have driving time to get where you're going. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, mm -hmm. just to meet the state law of an hour and a half on the bus, and when the kid, that first one's picked up, all of a sudden, because of traffic, now you have to have more buses. Well, I am <laughs> for the right plan. piece of property. In my opinion, you want to make sure that piece of property is the right spot. Because if you, mm -hmm. people are here, and they're going to the interstate, or they're going into Murfreesboro, or they're going to work, and you fail to school out here. All of a sudden, they're driving out there, then they're coming right back past their house. That was my argument about a piece of property last year we looked at. We were going to push 5,000 kids in the wrong direction for four miles, and all those people in bus line have to come back to our right path. 
pass their house for the most part to go to work or whatever. So we need to make sure those schools land in the right traffic pattern so we're not making that much more of a traffic problem ourselves because a three student, a three school co campus generates a world of traffic. You don't want to do, double it by having them go the wrong, have to backtrack to go in the wrong direction. Several of our, my house. Um, I'm sorry, no, go ahead. Just, this is a five year plan, but let's say we had to adjust our our road system to some degree to, to, to meet some of this. To, just to plan on expanding a road, not even building a new one, but just to expand a road. It takes about 12 years. So if we needed to expand some road just to get to a new school, by the time we went through condemnation and all kinds of stuff to, to improve those roads, it takes about 12 years. So we're way behind, and and that's the reason that I'm preaching right now is that is that we have to have the impact so that we'll know what we're facing, not only for the next five years but for the next fifteen or twenty years. This has been a very important discussion, and several of our school board members have taken the time to be here. I want to give them an opportunity to speak if they had anything they wanted to add before we adjourn. Good. Anybody else on the committee have anything? Well, thank you for listening to us. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. And the school board members too. Thank you. Is there any new business for this committee? All right. We stand adjourned. <laughs>